History laid the foundation that informs our conversation. Welcome to the classroom. From the church house to the streets. Welcome back to another episode of Fannie Lou's Classroom. We're so excited you tuned in at 12 o'clock noon to get a different type of nourishment for your body on this afternoon in Fannie Lou's Classroom. We're super excited about this second episode into our fourth season. But first, as I always have to do, I have to give it up and recognize and thank God for our amazing Fannie Lou's Classroom team. And so Brooke, as you know, holds it down every Thursday. So let's give it up for Brooke, our audio engineer engineer and then of course we couldn't do this without our other amazing team members Cheryl and Shanika let's give it up for Cheryl and Shanika and then of course we want to um, thank all of our ministry partners in the justice ministry who also are part of family's classroom and doing our research crafting questions so we thank you for all that you have been to family's classroom and thank you for tuning in those of you who have supported us over the past four seasons and remember you can not only catch us on YouTube you can catch us on Spotify, Amazon Music, and wherever you find your other favorite podcasts. So make sure you like, share, and subscribe to Family's Classroom, T- uh, Family's Classroom YouTube channel, as well as like us on Instagram and Facebook. So, you know, last week we kicked off Season 4 very powerfully with the Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III, our senior pastor, and now the new president, CEO of Rainbow Push. And we had a conversation around, you know, how he sees Push going forward, how he's going to build on the legacy of Reverend Jackson. And we really began to have conversation around the necessity of institution building, of building infrastructures, but also what does it mean to develop policies that can positively impact our communities. And so I think it's going to be another amazing conversation today, which will really just pick up on or piggyback on where Dr. Haynes left off on last week. And I think it's so important because oftentimes we respond to acts of physical violence where we are really wanting to come together to have solidarity power, to do something about policing in America because of the state-sanctioned murders, physical violence that we see every day, we're quick to respond to. But I want to offer up, like we did last week, that we have to deal with structural violence and the ways in which policies and laws can kill us slowly. And we need to be alert of that. And how do we engage on the front end? Uh, Instead of reacting, how can we be more proactive and making sure that we have life-giving and not death-dealing policies? Uh, And I always think about Lauryn Hill's, you know, killing me softly. And that's really what structural violence does. And we don't recognize. So how can we have conversation to show the ways that it does disrupt our lives? But also, what can we do? We have the power to make sure that we also construct policies and laws that will be um, beneficial to our communities. And so with that in mind, I want to introduce our two guests on today. We have two brilliant people today. And I want us to really lean into the conversation we'll have on today. I think it's critically important that we have this. So for those of you who are listening now and who will listen later, please share this conversation um, that we're going to have on the day. I think it's so important. So first, we have Reverend Dr. Delman, Delman Coates, who is a graduate of Morehouse College. He has his Master's of Divinity from Harvard Divinity School, his Master in Philosophy from Columbia University in Religion, and his PhD in New Testament and Early Christianity. Dr. Coates has served as the senior pastor of Mount Enon Baptist Church in Clinton, Maryland, since 2004. During this time, the congregation has grown to 9,000 members. Dr. Coates has initiated and revitalized ministries, expanded the church's ministry campus and landing holdings, and incorporated the Mount Enon Development Corporation. In October 2009, Outreach magazine named Mount Enon is one of the 100 fastest growing congregations in the U.S. Pastor Coates founded the board chair, is the founder and board chair of the Black Church Center for Justice and Equality. He is a board member of the Parents Television Council and the National Action Network. He is also a member of the Society of Biblical Literature. Coates' ministry, message, and social activism 
spans a variety of media platforms. He has appeared on and has been profiled in national media such as MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, Essence Magazine, NPR, VH1, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and Huffington Post, and is featured in the documentary The New Black. Dr. Coates is the proud father of four children, a son Nathaniel and three daughters, Jasmine, Ava Marie, and Leah Blair. Let's welcome the Reverend Dr. Delman Coates to Fain Lou's classroom. So much, Danielle. So delighted to be with you today. And then we have Miss Lakeitha Anderson. Lakeitha has over 15 years of experience in corporate government affairs arena. She, curr- she is currently a policy director for Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber, and Shrek, where she is responsible for advancing corporate clients' legislative objectives before the White House, members of Congress, the administration, and other policy makers on issues such as excise taxes, FDA regulations, and she works especially with the Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. Lakeitha is a native Texan. She's from Dallas, y'all. Began her career as a legislative assistant for Texas State Representative Helen Giddings. She continued her political career, political career next, working with the Texas Senate, where she worked on legislation ranging from education enrichment to school finance to economic development. Most notably, she was a member of the Read to Succeed Education Task Force, assembled by then-Governor George Bush. Shortly after leaving Texas, she later worked on the U.S. Senate campaign of of former city of Dallas mayor Ron Kirk in both Dallas and Washington, D.C. Lakeitha is very active in various social and professional organizations, such as the Lynx Incorporated, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, Caliber ELC Organization. In addition to being a graduate of University of North Texas, Lakeitha has an executive MBA from Georgetown University. She is an avid runner, having completed three marathons, and enjoys skiing and golfing. She currently resides in Washington, D.C. Let's welcome Ms. Lakeitha Anderson to Fannie Lou's classroom. Hello, hello. Thank you so much, Danielle. Great, great introduction. <laughs> so, as you all can see, and I just read a brief, uh, just a portion of their bios. Please read their full bios in the description under this episode. But I just need you to know these are two brilliant people that I think um, I want to pull together to have this conversation because of where they sit in this work. And I think it's going to be an exceptional dialogue. I'm just here to facilitate. They have all the answers, all the information. And so as we enter in this dynamic learning community, I want to lean into, so Dr. Coates, one of the things, I think it was when you were here, I feel like it was the summer, and you can correct me, um, at Antioch Baptist Church. And I believe it was, um, was it a joint meeting of Baptists? It was um, the, in September for the National Baptist Convention of America. Yes, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. So we came over to Antioch that night um, to support the convention and to support Dr. Haynes' preaching. And you presented the Freedom Plan um, to us. And I, and I had never heard of it, but I was as you were presenting, I was just had my wheels turned. I started texting people like, have you heard of this? Have you seen this? Because I'm always telling people we really need to produce, in my estimation, a real policy agenda. Uh, and so I said, wow, this is amazing. So when we were thinking about season four. I was like, we have to have Dr. Coates come on to really talk about it, unpack it a little bit more. And then I said, hmm, we also need someone who is really in the government arena, who, who knows how to advance policy, who's worked on policy, to have this kind of dialogue. And so um, and I like it because it calls for, right, this monetary freedom, if you will, right? And so I want to do this. I want to open us up, and I want to kind of center us Around, I'm going to kind of pull Dr. King in here for a moment. I've been watching the MLK X uh, series on National Geographic, so I'm like, <laughs> you're like freshly, you know, uh, thinking about King again in this moment. But I want to start with this clip to kind of set the tone for our conversation. So let's listen. You won't see it, but you'll hear it. <laughs> so we're going to listen to um, Dr. King. At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land. Through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, 
They built land-grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. Not only that, today many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. Now, this is what we are faced with, and this is a reality. Now, when we come to Washington in this campaign, we are coming to get our check. So I always love playing this clip of King because <laughs> this is what we don't hear on the commercials and we don't hear them at all, the King celebrations. And it really goes to the heart of what I want to talk about today. On the one hand, I want to talk about how we have to be more engaged in policy um, because if they provided this economic floor, it was done through an institution, right? Someone set a policy to say, this is what we're going to do. And when I think of hearing, every time I hear and talk about land grant colleges, like, right, I go back to um, Alcorn State University, for example, right in Mississippi, where it was founded that $257 million had been withheld from Alcorn State in terms of agriculture program. And then Dr. Glenda Glover, you know, in Tennessee, former international president of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. That's for you, Lakeitha. I, I got it. <laughs> but, you know, just how she fought for that money right in Tennessee where they're looking at $554 million that was not given. So this thing that King was talking about then so we're, we're beginning to see, right, how this is now starting to, to come to light. And so how policy then can disrupt generations. And I think oftentimes we think about economics, for example, at least for me when I see, so, when I'm on social media, whether it's TikTok, whether it's Instagram, it's about how do I get in my bag? How do I secure the bag? It's very individualistic. And not that we shouldn't, you know, think about our own futures, you know, wealth generation, but... I think that's why I love this plan, Dr. Cooks. I think we have to move beyond that and think about what does it mean for, um, what does it mean communally, right, for us all then to be able to have access to resources. Um, yep. So let's just kind of start there because I think how can we shift our focus from not individualistic but more communal that's for a greater impact for generations to come. So first let's start here maybe. Um, let's start with, tell us what the Freedom Plan is Let's start there. Well, first, Pastor Danielle, I want to thank you for really convening the Black church around for this Fannie Lou's classroom. It's a, an important uh, contribution and really a way of framing the intersection between our faith and justice, Jesus and justice. So thank you for your voice, your leadership, and uh, for inviting me to be on today. <clears throat> so the Freedom plan is a public policy agenda that a campaign that was born out of our church um, uh, in conjunction with a cohort of economists from around the country put together. Um, and the, the, the name of the campaign was called the, is called the Our Money Campaign. And you can find information about our campaign on our website, OurMoneyUS.org. And if you scroll down, you'll see a link that says view our public policy agenda. Now, I developed this campaign to really educate thought leaders, influencers and faith leaders about an aspect of economics that we don't often talk about, and that's monetary and fiscal policy. Oftentimes in the black church, when people talk about economics, it, it's around issues of personal finance. Um, uh, and if you know, that is savings, budgeting, you might get some introduction around entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and things of this nature. But the unique aspect of the Our Money campaign is that it really seeks to educate thought leaders about macroeconomics, because what we deal with at the micro level, the experiences that we have at the micro level are a function of what's happened at the macroeconomic level. And a lot of faith leaders, we don't learn about monetary and fiscal policy when we go to seminary, right? Right. And um, that's that's a very important 
uh, gap in our education and training for this reason. Most people think that the federal government's budget works like a home. But when you begin to learn the key tenets of monetary and fiscal policy uh, as thought as taught through the prism of uh, modern monetary theory, and there are a host of economists on our advisory board who really help us to understand that we make a fatal flaw by thinking that the federal government's budget, its capacity to spend, works like a home, like a household. And so when we teach faith leaders, influencers, I've taught entertainers and rappers who've used their platform around social justice to really help them to understand that we have been misled about the capacity of the federal government to invest in the priorities that we desperately need today. And so our campaign is really about one, is about a, se a several shifts that I think are really key and important and that you heard in Dr. King's quote that you just shared. And that is, we have to re-legitimize the role of government. We are heirs and legatees of a history of policymaking that wants to delegitimize the role of government, demonize the role of government. And what has happened as a product of neoliberal economic theory that we've been heirs of for the last 50 to 75 years is public corporations delegitimize the role of government when it comes to poor people and individuals and yet they harness the capacity of the federal government when it comes to bailing out banks, corporate subsidies, uh, bailing out corporations, et cetera. And so we believe that it's important to re-legitimize the role of government so that we can then begin to marshal our political energies around articulating a policy vision that really benefits the masses and not just a few. I became convinced of this as a pastor with the range of organizations that I that I'm a part of. Whenever I'm invited as a faith leader to attend meetings with politicians, I began to notice over the last 15 years in particular that we oftentimes as black faith leaders and civil rights leaders ask politicians, what is your plan for us? Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to change that and we need to start telling politicians what our plan is for them. Every other voting bloc in the country has a specific policy plan for those that represent them. But oftentimes in the African-American community, we, we, def we abdicate our power by asking politicians, well, what is your right. plan for us? Mm -hmm. Now, when I say that, people may say, well, no, when we meet, we tell politicians about health care is an issue and education is an issue. And I try to help people to understand that a list of issues is not a policy agenda. Right. Telling politicians that, oh, we want improvements in education or we want to address the health care gap is not a policy agenda. And so the Freedom Plan is a specific public policy agenda that is centered around this recognition, that all of our social, economic, and political challenges center around two interrelated pillars, expanding access to the ballot and expanding access to the budget. They are interrelated. They, they are, it, this policy agenda is really centered on the idea that just telling our people to get out to vote is important but insufficient if it doesn't attach the vote to a specific policy vision, right? That there has to be a, an understanding that we've got to connect voting and funding. And you will find in the Freedom Plan, and again, I encourage your listeners, as I've gone around the country, I'm presently organizing faith leaders, civil rights leaders, academics, and others around a, the core tenet of the Freedom Plan, which right now centers around eliminating unemployment in America. Mm. Get this, most of the public does not understand that unemployment is structurally engineered in America, that policymakers structurally engineer unemployment 
uh, when they maintain certain monetary policy tools like interest rate policy and other monetary policy tools to structurally engineer unemployment. And the unfinished work of the civil rights movement, at the end of that clip, Dr. King says, the reason we're coming to Washington, mm -hmm. the title of the March on Washington, the full title right. was the March on right. Washington for Jobs right. and Freedom. And that march was designed to get passage of 10 demands. Most people don't even know, Pastor Danielle, about the 10 demands of the March on Washington. Well, one of those demands was the fight for a federal job guarantee. This is very important. I know Lakeitha Anderson knows about this because a federal job guarantee was pushed and advocated in the 40s by the nation's first black economist, not black woman economist, the nation's first black mm. economist, a woman by the name of Sadie Alexander. She's the <laughs> first national president, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Just saying. Just saying. She is the country's first black economist. And she talks in the 40s mm -hmm. that we have got to eliminate unemployment in America. That as long as whites fear that black and brown people have entering the labor market, have the ability to take their jobs and their ability to provide for their families, we're going to continue to get this racial social tension in America. And she was advocating a federal job guarantee. It is a policy priority that all of those male leaders of the civil rights movement 15 to 20 years later picked up and brought yeah. a quarter million people to Washington saying we have got to eliminate unemployment in America. Coretta Scott King in the 70s let 1.2 million people to fight for a federal job guarantee. So um, the, the Freedom Plan is really a specific set of policy priorities. I, I believe it's the biggest, baddest, boldest, most robust set of policies to address the disparities that we face mm -hmm. in unemployment, health care, and public education, and household debt. Are there other issues facing our people and facing our community? Yes. But I tell people, when you start building a house, you don't start building on the second floor. Foundationally, we have got to eliminate unemployment in America. We've got to provide more federal funding for public education and deal with this health care crisis where people should not go in debt or uh, go bankrupt mm -hmm. because they get sick. And I want to encourage you and your viewers to go to our website, ourmoneyus.org. Go down to get our policy agenda. We are right now organizing faith leaders, civil rights leaders, and influencers around uh, a federal job guarantee. I'm going to say this in closing. I think about the Freedom Plan as the playbook and the job guarantee is the play that we're calling. Okay. It is the one policy priority that we are focused on today, and that is eliminating unemployment. Wow. You Look, this is a classroom, so we all learning. I'm taking all kind of notes here, and I have like a thousand follow-up questions. You said so much in there. Um, because this is an issue, right? I, as I love that you – I like this whole thing about the ballot, access to the ballot and the budget, right? And that's what I often tell people. You're worried about how people treat you. <laughs> But you need to understand how they treat you when it comes to policies and laws, right? That's what you need to lean into, not what they're calling you on TV or out in the streets. We need to have our attention on how they're treating us by way of what's getting passed or not getting passed. So, gosh, I don't know which way I want to go. I've got several ways I want to go with this. But let me do this. I want to bring Lakeitha into um, the conversation. Then I'm going to circle back to many, much of what you said. So, Lakeitha, maybe what I want to say to you is, number one, um, if you want to respond to – what Dr. Costa said, maybe it's one thing you want to pick up on, because then I have a follow-up for you, because you do policy every day, right? You help people to advance their policy agendas, right? Mm -hmm. So, but mm -hmm. first, let me maybe get your response to Dr. Costa, and then I want to lean into um, this whole idea of how you help people move policy agenda, and what does that mean for, like, folks who may be on the ground organizing, right? How can they organize around policy agenda and move that? How do we get everyday folks that we're trying to pull into movement building to 
to understand that we have to do more than, you know, just march and rally. We have to do more than just be on social media. TikTok, all that is good, but the groundwork has to happen. The groundwork has to happen. And that takes, you know, that's being done off camera, right? So maybe those two things, your initial response, and then talk to us about how we can really move policy agenda since that's really your um, your niche there and what you do. Right. First of all, uh, Dr. Coates, I, I completely agree with everything you said, and I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate you pointing out the things that you're doing and that we need to do. Um, I also appreciate you sh- sh- shouting out Sara Sadie T.M. Alexander <laughs> as one of your examples. Um, and, and then also, too, uh, if I may, I've done a lot of work with National Action Network over the, over the years. So I'm very familiar with your organization and very familiar, familiar um, with um, with the reference uh, push. Um, and I've been I've been on the watch on the March on Washington twice uh, during COVID and, and then after COVID. So uh, so kudos to you on that. Uh, so, Danielle, I, I help companies advance their agendas. Um, It's interesting, just earlier today, it was working with a member to get a letter uh, from a a client on regulations on electricity um, and energy. Um, So to your your piece of how do we mobilize it, it's a lot more than just marching. It's a lot more than just speaking at the panel. It's an actual vote. Okay, um, a lot of times where members that I'm very close to have lost their seats or maintain a smaller mar- margins is because we don't show up. Okay, mm-hmm. so how are most things accomplished? They're accomplished first by showing up. Um, and so, so, so that's my that's my first piece. Like we have to vote. We have to vote because if we don't vote, we continue to see these movements of the attack on DEI, which I work a lot in that, uh, in that, in that uh, realm. Then also healthcare. Um, you know, one of the biggest impediments for our people, I will say, if I can speak to about our people, is healthcare. We lost a lot of people during COVID, not just because of COVID but how the attack on the body mm-hmm. measured, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and because we went into COVID not being healthy, okay? And I say that, I can, I'm, I, I was ashamed at first about it, but I can say, say it now, I got COVID twice, okay? Um, first time, it felt like a cold, right? The second time, it felt a little worse, but each time, I was fine. You know why? I was healthy. Mm-hmm. I was healthy. I am healthy. Okay. You know, you talked about the marathon running that, that is um, because my health means a lot to me. So that was one of the things that health, healthcare, education, um, being able to speak to our education progress, like our education uh, uh, goals are very important to our, our people. Um, uh, Dr. Koch, you spoke about CDT and all time. You spoke about Delta Sigma Theta because it was it was arranged for college age women. All sororities, right? I mean, I just pick out Delta. All sororities around college age women. The most important word is college. Okay, so college help. The civil rights. College, college help. The social justice. Mm-hmm. College help. The economic justice. College help the education, all those things that are very important to our people. College is one of the main factors of it. Um, so, uh, because this huge, big attack on DEI, and I had to explain this to my nephew who was applying for law school, and he wanted to talk about his personal statement. I don't know, we all know what a personal statement is. And then he wanted to add an addendum to his personal statement about diversity. I was like, well, wait a minute. I mean, I applied to law school a long time ago. There's only one personal statement, right? You only submit one personal statement. 
Now, what you include in a personal statement could be a myriad of things. So how about we take your addendum with the DEI statement and include it in your personal statement? Because DEI is you. Mm -hmm. It's you. It's how you live. It's how you learn. It's how you were raised. And I've been talking to my, my, my clients about that. You know, there's an attack on it. And I've seen a lot of organizations that have fallen in financial ruin because, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they don't have any way to put their money. They're not getting the funding anymore because of the attack, because companies are afraid of what the members would do. Um, but we have to stay, stay true to our nature. And there's more than one way to do it. Uh, we need the marches. We need the panel discussions. Mm -hmm. We also right. need the education. Okay. Um, so that's my, I just think there's a lot of things packed in there. Uh, but I do believe, um, uh, Dr. Coates, where you talk about our money, financial security is the biggest threat today. And it's, it's, it's beyond the Gucci purses and Louis Vuitton purses and whatever, right? It's beyond that. We need to talk to our people about retirement. We need to talk to our people about savings. We need to talk to our people about the market, you know? There are a lot of pieces we can educate our people on. And I just say our people, everybody, right? On how you overcome. Because sometimes they can't touch you when you have these pieces in order. So. That's my little, sh my opening spiel. <laughs> <on it. laughs> so. so, yeah, so, and, and just to um, piggyback also on what you're saying, and this is why I feel is important, this is why elections matter, because I think we see how the unraveling happens when we don't vote, when certain people are in place. So if you take DEI, for example, here in Texas, like I testified before several committees, when, which living in Texas, we knew what was going to happen, but I tell people, you still show up. Because you mm -hmm. certainly shouldn't go out without fighting. Who, you know, mm -hmm. you shouldn't, it shouldn't be saying that you didn't even show up to fight for it, right? And right. so I remember so many of the committees we sat in, you know, the attack on DEI, we knew it was going to pass to, you know, remove all of the mm -hmm. um, DEI offices across the state, in, uh, mm -hmm. particularly in the mm -hmm. colleges and universities. And I'm looking at, you know, Arian Simone, for example, with the Fearless Fund, mm -hmm. right, who's trying to give money to black people women entrepreneurs who we know rarely get access to funding. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's why I think sometimes it's how we, and I'm going to come back around to something Dr. Co said earlier, because this is my thing is always, how do we take what we know and how do we then make that accessible to everyday people so they can see the connections? I think connecting the dots for people is going to be critical if we're really trying to move the masses to really exercise their right to vote, not go vote just because you need to vote, but vote with intelligence, vote with a plan, like vote for something, not against something, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what are you voting for? And so one of the things I thought about when you were talking, Dr. Coates, about this need to uh, re-legitimize government, because, of course, they certain folks want to make it seem like it's an evil thing while they're benefiting from it, and then we'll buy into it, right? So I think about student loans as a good example, right? They don't want to cancel student loans, but yet Marjorie Taylor Greene and others got their PPP loans, um, mm -hmm. you know, forgiven. So how? So to me, it's like how do we kind of show people the connections, uh, or something as simple as um, I remember Dr. Haynes told this story when he was teaching at Paul Quinn. A young man was in his class, and he was like, "I don't see the need to vote." I, you know, this whole thing people died to vote doesn't resonate with him. So, but he had some. He had a run in with the law. And he had to go before a judge, and it didn't really work in his favor. And so Dr. Haynes said, well, how do you think the judge got there? Right. right? Somebody voted to put him into that seat. So it's also this idea of how can we really begin to use everyday examples uh, to get people to understand to connect it to a larger a larger movement, right, to understand how it, there's a larger thing at play here and that it's not about you individually, but it's about a system Right, yeah. that we're either trying to deconstruct and reconstruct something that's more equitable, and then sometimes how we're also creating parallel systems while we're trying to deal with the main system. And I think the Fearless Fund would be an example of that, right? So women, black women in particular, are not getting access to funding. So the Fearless Fund is then coming alongside and saying, okay, we're going to raise money to support the black women so they can have access to capital to expand, you know, to the capacity build, et cetera. So... I'm wondering then if the if the jobs right if this federal 
um, jobs guarantee is the play at the moment. What's the messaging for people? Because, I mean, today is Election Day in America, and hopefully people are, are voting. I wish we had this conversation months ago to get people ready. But we have the fall coming, right? So we still have general election in the fall. Because I really like this idea. Because that's something I think people can understand. Jobs, um, you being able to pay this rent. That, you know, your rent's 2000 You didn't make three <laughs> times the rent, but you only made $50,000 a year. Where are you going to live, right? So what's um, – tell us about how well, you're – yes, go ahead. Let me let me respond to your first uh, real comment or question is how do we help people understand the practicality mm -hmm. of the importance of being engaged in, in you know, uh, what's happening in the public square? And I think what we have to do, uh, Pastor Danielle, is resist the either-or construct in which – all of these issues are oftentimes put in. That is, it's either government or the individual. Mm -hmm. It's either Du Bois or Booker T. Yes, it's, either, yeah. it's either self-empowerment or we need to advocate for, you know, for systemic change. And I think the reality is, is that we really need both and, that mm -hmm. we continue to get polarized because we allow those interests who aren't in our best interest yes. To divide us by making it appear that it's either um, self-help, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, or uh, advocating for some systemic change. The reality is, is that we need both. Mm -hmm. We need you to work hard. We need you to study at night so that you can write a gr prepare a great application. But we also have to be involved politically so that someone is required to read your application. Right. <laughs> right. And so the first thing that I want to say is, is let's try to get out of this either or sort of mm -hmm. dynamic mm -hmm. and really articulate a kind of both and uh, uh, path forward. The other thing that I want to say is, um, you know, I think a lot about how do we add, how do we get change in our community? And, one of the things I think is important for us to realize is that we don't have the kind of financial resources to fund campaigns and politicians like other folks do. We don't have millions of dollars to give away to political parties and to fund individual candidates in the, in, in the aggregate, right? But what we do have is our voice and our vote. I think our voices and our vote is the capital that we need to harness, right? Now, to do that, we need to develop strategically solidarity yeah. around a unified issue, mm -hmm. okay? Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if those of you who are, those who are around in the 80s, and I happen to be around in the late 80s, Ralph Reed, who was one of the chief architects of sort of the, the right, one, you know, uh, of the right, talked a lot about wedge issues, mm -hmm. right? And he would say that, you know, on the right, we're concerned about a lot of things, taxes, you know, we're concerned about judges. But when we show up in certain communities, you can't talk about taxes and tax policy because it really doesn't land with the average ordinary person. But what we need is we need wedge issues, right? And for them at a time when a voting block that they were interested in harnessing was not politically active, like evangelicals. Today, we tend to think about evangelicals as being politically active. Well, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, they didn't believe in voting because Jesus was coming back at any time. And they needed to find an issue that would get that population mm -hmm. politically active. And, and Paul Weyrick and the other architects of you know, right-wing movement in America found an issue and the issue was abortion. Y yes. They found an issue that would galvanize their community. Now their goal was to really, to get schools like Liberty University and Bob Jones University to be able to deny admission to blacks. That was their goal. But their tool to get there was uh, abortion. All right. So what we need to do is we need to articulate what is the progressive wedge issue that sort of intersects 
all of the other many of the other issues we face today whether it's family household debt crime education uh keeping you know uh men in the lives of their children uh health care what's the sort of intersectional issue that sort of connects with all with with many of the issues we face today and i've discerned that a very important root issue is employment when people don't have employment, right. mm -hmm. it takes them out of their family. It forces them into the underground economy. When people don't have employment, they don't have health care and a range of other collateral uh, issues stem from that. Right. And so we cannot get comfortable when America says unemployment is at a historic low. There are so many people who are not included right. in the uh labor statistics for unemployment right and if if america's saying uh four percent unemployment is low well you know in black and brown communities the unemployment is ten percent so we cannot accept that we have got to have a true public option for jobs and i've discerned that if we could figure out how to get many of our leaders and organ organizations singing from a similar sheet of music mm -hmm um by trying to identify what is that wedge issue that we can organize around right i think that we can maximize our political power but as long as we continue to present lists of 20 issues of concern mm -hmm. this is the most this is the most destructive thing a community that doesn't have that much financial power can do because what the powers that be what they end up doing is they end up dividing your coalition. Right. They end up saying, oh, we like issues three, four, and five. And this politician over here says we like issues eight, nine, and 10. And it ends up dividing your coalition, right? So I, I believe that what we have to do strategically is to identify that, that wedge issue and figure out how to uh, come together in solidarity around that. Here's what Dr. King said in the aftermath of the riots in the 60s. He said, if a soul is left in darkness, sins will be committed. Mm -hmm. But the gift... Uh-oh, is that us? Uh-oh, Lakeitha, are you still with us? I think Dr. I'm Co still here. Yeah, uh, he something happened to his, he froze, but I'm here. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, um, because he was on it. He was on it. Like, <laughs> he may have to come back in. So while we, well, so why wait for Dr. Coates to come back in? But so, because what he's really getting at, right, is that the the strategy here is what is that issue that we all can agree on? Now we'll talk when he comes back. I want to talk about how we get us to agree on something, right? Um, but in your in your experience. Because you work, because you really drive, you help organizations drive their, mm -hmm. they have their agenda. They're clear mm -hmm. about what their ask is. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. do you help also craft that ask or do they come and you just take what they have and you move it? Or do you say, this is the best way to shape and frame? This is how it can be received. Because I think sometimes that's also part of what we have to get into. What's what I call, mm -hmm. refer to as narrative power. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. do you use the so power? So I do both. Yes. I okay. Both. So I talk to both. us about right. that. So on one hand, you know, uh, because I, I, I am a, um, a, a contractor or a consultant for companies, right? And so it's a broad, there's a broad brush painted there. But I'm going to take DEI for an example because of my closeness with the Congressional Black Caucus. And, and so I had to make sure I explain uh, the, the goal of, the survey that are being that's being issued by the Congressional Black Caucus is not to destroy the eye, is not to call for its removal, is not to make sure five more black people are hired. That's right. not the goal of it. Right. It's the goal of it is to protect it. And so I I counseled my 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 clients that you must respond to this. Mm -hmm. Okay, especially those who have a great trans, a track record of making sure DEI is part of their their I guess you call it third party or your 
your, um, what do you call it? Your ERGs, right? Um, and so you got to make sure that you're heard, right? And you and then for those companies, because we represent a lot of major Fortune 500 companies, you have walked the walk. So just explain what you do and take credit for it. You know, take credit for right. your work here. Uh, but that is a very important piece that was important to the Congressional Red Caucus that I helped them drive to corporations and I helped them to explain it. Because one thing about DEI that we've gotten away from is the definition of it, mm -hmm. right? And, and as I said before, DEI doesn't mean you hire three black people, three Hispanic people, three Asian people, three women, and three, three older people. That's not diversity. Mm -hmm. Diversity is diversity of thought. You know, utilize those people from different backgrounds to tell the story. Mm -hmm. Now, I see Dr. Coates is back. I'm going to definitely okay. uh, 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 move to him. But I wanted to say one thing he that he spoke about is the political prowess. Mm -hmm. Yes, talk we, about we, it. Yes. You know, one major movement in any form of government, federal, state, and local, and I've, I've worked on all three, is a political action committee. It's a PAC where the money is where the money comes from. Um, those are very powerful pieces. A PAC is a very powerful piece of money <laughs> that you're used to galvanize and move any particular individual's um, message, right? So yes, we may not have a lot of money individually, but as a collective, a pack can be very powerful to ensure yes. your your motive and your message is carried and, and heard. Okay. Um, so I agree with you about that. I think that that's a very good political tool that's utilized to make sure the right words and the right issues are being heard and being paid attention to. Yeah. It, it can be swept under under that's the right. it can be swept under the rug if no one pays attention. But you have that that movement, like DEI. DEI is why is it so big? We're paying attention to it. It's not just because it benefits everybody. It's because we're paying attention, and people are paying attention, and companies are paying attention. So, however, however the the message or however the means are utilized, you want to make sure it's utilized to pay attention to it. And I love your wedge issues. I, I love that statement. Mm -hmm. I love that because that's a really good issue. Mm -hmm. You have your big issues, but you have your issues in the middle that people don't pay attention to like they should. And they are the very ones that if you're not paying attention to and not and not and not heightened, it could be the one that takes it down. Right. Right. Dr. Dr. Coates, are you back with us? Because you were on a roll back. when you I'm when so you so fell off. So you happy. we were letting you, you I just, tell you I what's been on the phone. The enemy wants to <laughs> wants to stop me. I'm but, sorry about that. No. I tried to fill in a little yeah. bit, Dr. Coates. I was telling you where to hear you, but I was trying to do it. Yeah. <laughs> you were you were on a roll and speaking so much truth, right? Because I think you're you're in the that's where it is. That's what it is. What is that one thing? And what's I was telling thing? the Keith, I was telling the Keith because because really to me, I, I translate that into the work I do to me that's the solidarity power that we don't have right we're scattered right we're scattered and we're allowing yeah. ourselves to be as such and sometimes because we're looking for position right we may right. not say that's what that is but we'll pick a, some issues over here that we want to do so we can kind of be out there in the forefront of a particular issue when we need to sit down and say because here's the reality particularly when it comes to faith communities if you're pastoring a church when it comes to employment the labor market, that impacts all of us, right? So it's, it's this, how do, so yes, I appreciate that solidarity. And one thing, as you came back in, I was talking to Lakeitha about, because it's also this notion around, and you talked a little bit about this around, you know, talk about micro and macro. It's also this thing of what's a meta narrative that's out there around an issue. So it's also this idea what kind of we have power when it comes to narrative power. We have to construct what's the message. And then we're all saying the same thing, right? So that we have a consistent message. And that's what she was when you came back in, she was leaning into that as it relates to uh DI. So did you want to pick up where you left off? Because you were 
You were on it. You were spitting. It's on a roll there. I think <laughs> what I was saying is Dr. King has this quote. He's quoting Victor Hugo. The context is, mm. is sort of after the riots in mm. the 60s. And yeah. uh, quoting the, uh, Victor Hugo, Dr. King says, if a soul is left in darkness, sins will be committed. But the guilty one is not he who commits the sins, but the causes of the darkness. Right. So when we start thinking about mm -hmm. what's that policy priority that we're going to coalesce around, we need to start thinking about what's the cause of the darkness. Because yes. Dr. King kind of goes on this thing about the difference between derivative injustices and causative injustices, right? And and the cause and the cause of the darkness is about what's at the root, right? When you get yes. sick, Danielle. Yes. If your doctor just treats the symptoms mm -hmm. and not the source, you're just going to leave and get sick again, right. right? And so if we are assessing our patient today in our community in Black America, we can't just treat the symptoms. We got to figure out how do we get at the source. And not only, and, 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 so I th and so for me, when I think about an issue that is at that foundational level, that kind of springs off into so many other issues. For me, it is about our need to address the way in which my, uh, policymakers accept unemployment. We balance the economy on the backs of the poor. Mm -hmm. And I wanna encourage mm -hmm. you and all your listeners to get this paper entitled What We Get Wrong About the Racial Wealth Gap. Mm. It came out of Duke University, the Samuel, uh, the, uh, Samuel Cook uh, School of Economics there, Dr. William Sandy Darity, Derek Hamilton, and other economists uh, came together nationally some years ago to talk about what we get wrong about the racial wealth gap. Mm. And what I think is key about that is a lot of times we are given the wrong answers to the right questions. So you kind of opened up, Danielle, talking about the way in which in the social media space right now, we hear all of these social media influencers framing the issue of economics in terms of individual wealth, individual wealth accumulation. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, what is it? Getting the bag? Right. Uh, Secure the bag. Yeah. Get the, yeah. Securing the bag. Multiple streams of income. Right. We even see people talking about, you know, if all of the rich black people and all of the churches kind of got together right. and put money in a fund, we could like solve all the problems in black America. No, right. that sounds good, but it's not the case. And Dr. Darity, who's a black economist at Duke, said something I think was very profound. He said the challenge in the black community is that many of our leaders hear large numbers and they think it's a lot of money to address the issues in the black community. To address the racial wealth gap, I was on a, 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 a panel with him some years ago, and he gave this example. He said, if philanthropists came together and said, we're going to give all of the black leaders and organizations a billion dollars a month to address the wealth gap. Most of those leaders and organizations would accept it. Like, yeah, a billion dollars a month? Absolutely, we'll accept that to address the, the consequences of slavery and segregation. He said at that rate, it would take nine centuries or 900 years to address the current consequences of the racial wealth gap at that rate. So in other words, he said, the issue is not that we don't need entrepreneurs, we do. The issue is not that we don't need cooperative economics, we do. The problem is the gaps that we're faced today were caused by the federal government. Yeah. And so if it was caused by the federal government, we missed, we missed the opportunities to address it by saying, oh, Oprah, Jay-Z, and Beyonce, if they got together and put their money in a pot, <laughs> we could fix the problems or black churches got together. We could fix the problems in that way. So if the problems were caused systemically, mm -hmm. it's going to take That's systemic right. That's remedies right. That's right. to address it. That's and right. so 
It's not that we don't need to rely on ourselves and rely on our community. We do. But we cannot abdicate. We cannot relieve the federal That's government right. of its responsibility to address the crises that it continues to create and the public subsidies that are given every day to public corporations. Right. Do you know, Danielle, that every day at four o'clock in the mm -hmm. overnight interbank lending market, the largest financial institutions in the world benefit from public subsidies or public welfare public until economy. nine o'clock the next morning and make billions of dollars. So why is it that public supports work for Wall Street? Mm -hmm. They work for the banks. They work to bail out corporations. But for some reason, you know, uh, uh, health care for all is a handout to people who mm -hmm. don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. Or a public option for jobs or a federal job guarantee is a handout for people who are lazy. Look, the laziest institutions, <laughs> sectors of our society are, is the financial sector, which, which reaps in hundreds of billions of dollars. They extract their wealth on the back yes. of the public for effectively doing nothing. nothing. And I think that is where we have to, that to me, that's the point of departure right there, right? How we have to get people to see that connection. And to your point, Dr. Cook, it's the both and. All of what we know we should be doing, but also, because we have to do these things on the left, right? We have to be entrepreneurial. We have to have cooperative economics so we can, you know, survive and thrive the moment while we're trying to deal with that, right, this, this systemic issue that we have to face and break down and deal with. And I love the way you put that so succinctly that I think we all can get what you're saying in that regard. Uh, oh, we have five minutes left. Wow, it always goes so fast once we get going. Uh, that means I have to have you all to come back because I think this is, and that's why I wanted to have this conversation because I don't think we have this kind of conversation often enough in the public, like publicly. We do a lot in our small, you know, we meet with people, panels, that kind of thing. But I think we have to be, get the masses have to be exposed to this so that maybe next time when you're on TikTok, scrolling on Instagram and somebody says about securing a bag, multiple streams, maybe something would trigger like, yeah, I have to do that. But also, how do I get involved in this much larger issue, the macro issue? I, if, we, if it just gets one, two people to say, okay, let me kind of shift my thinking and say I have to be attentive to the both ends. And that means we have to get beyond like this Eurocentric uh, kind of narrative of view of what it means to be human. And that is it's about me only. Well, well the, the, I know we have a, a few minutes left, but I, the reason it's really critical and and what they don't tell us is that when they create jobs with the right hand, they maintain monetary policy tools to take away jobs with the left. So when I meet with politicians and, you know, members of the Maryland delegation mm -hmm. and they say, oh, well, we're supporting President Biden's jobs plan. And I say, OK, that sounds good. But let me ask you a question. If I create six jobs with my right hand, but I take away six right. jobs <laughs> with my left hand, how many jobs have I created? Right. And they say, well, none. Right. And I say, exactly. So telling us about the hundreds of thousands of jobs that are created with the president's right hand, but ignoring the fact yes. that Congress and the White House maint and the Federal Reserve maintain certain monetary policy tools to siphon or extract jobs out of the economy with the left is a deception to the public. And what we are dealing with today is a reality in which one party says mm -hmm. we don't want to give you anything and the other party that right. makes us think they're giving us something, but effectively at the end of the day doesn't. That, wow. I mean, that's so critical. And see, that's why we got to have these conversations. So that's just, people can understand that, right? It's that new math. You add and divide, you subtract and divide by adding, right? You add jobs through subtraction. And so it's like, how do we make that message very clear? And I appreciate you saying that so much because I feel like that's where the we have to keep this conversation going. So that's what's on people's minds. So they get that. And we didn't even talk about because. And you can talk about this probably too. So, and I think that's why we have to, what you're saying is important because they, maybe I'm watching the TV and I hear, oh, unemployment is at an all time low. And so maybe I'm thinking I'm just the eyeball out. I'm the one who can't find a job. When reality is that's not the case. And we didn't talk about underemployment, right? We haven't, we didn't talk about that either. So man, well, 
We're and we didn't talk about uh, messaging. We and we right, and that's why I was trying to pull you into. You know, I'm gonna take the privilege of can you talk a little bit about messaging because I think that's also important, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure mm -hmm. Dr. Coates has done some of this, but I know that's kind of how you help move mm -hmm. uh, agendas. Mm -hmm. So talk mm -hmm. to us about messaging, and then we'll wrap it. I, and thank you, I, thank you for allowing me to do that because I think messaging is very important because there could be a there could be 15, 20 good things that are happening. It's how you tell the story that matters. And I think that we have let our stories get away from us. And I mean, you know, 24 hour news may not mm. have been a smart move for the public because it's replaying over and over again yeah. without a lot of context in it. You know, so you can take away, oh, there's 50,000 jobs. But by the time they report that story, there's only 10,000 jobs left. So then 75,000 people start to compete for those 10,000 jobs. So at the end of the day, it's messaging. It's the end of the day, um, how you convey the message and how you explain it to mm -hmm. people. Right. That they can understand and how and understanding how it relates to them. So I do a lot of messaging. I believe it's very important for messages to be explained. And, you know, sometimes the one, two, three ABCs are just as powerful as the 10 letter words. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so I'm going to wrap it like this. Man, I because we didn't even get, there's so much more I wanted to get to that we just didn't get to uh, that I think is so important. So we're going to have to have you all come back for a part two before elections in the fall. So be look on the lookout. So I'm telling you now, I want to do a part two and have you come back. I have so much more I want to discuss with the both of you and particularly to unpack more of the freedom plan and how we might get people to vote on agenda, right? <laughs> And not mm -hmm. on emotion mm -hmm. and against something. I think that's going to be important for us to do. So let me wrap it like this. Normally what I do, I end because all of us, are usually folks on the show that I have are extremely busy people. Their vocation really takes them in so many places. Very busy. But I know that we also have things that we love to do outside of all the hustle and bustle of the day. So I always like to ask my guests, you know, what is the one thing that brings you joy? What do you do to just get away from it all? So I want you to answer that. And I want you to give me your parting thoughts. So give me your parting thought. And then what is that one thing that kind of gives you the joy in life? And how do you get away from it all? So either one of you can go first. I'll yield, I'll yield first to Lakeith. <laughs> okay, you know, you can do that. So um, my joy, I have a lot of joys. You know, I'm very active. I love to travel. I love to shop. I love to cook. I love to eat, you know, uh, and I love love to be with my friends. But in the last few years, I was I am, was a runner. I'm still a runner. I don't, have to run, I don't run as much. I love to walk around my neighborhood hmm. Hmm. Um, because... I'm able to take in the beauty of nature mm -hmm. in its most uh, original and natural self, right? Um, so that's that's how I find the joy uh, of, of, of detaching. And that's Good. my way. When things get a little rough in the work, put on my sneaks and I go walk. Nice. It's a run, but I walk now. Okay. So take it in. So any departing thought you want for us to, as a cliffhanger for when you come back? Yes. Um, get involved. Okay. Okay. Get involved. Yes. And, 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 and we, we started down this track earlier is not just getting involved just to vote. Mm -hmm. It's getting involved to learn and educate yourself so you can learn and educate others. Mm -hmm. Our children, our children are what are rating and are watching. Mm hmm so get involved for them. Thank you. Dr. Coates. You know, before we came on, attorney Anderson said that she has a birthday uh, coming up, I think when this airs, and I think that's awesome. Happy birthday. 
I just Thank turned you. 51, so welcome to the club. <laughs> I'm turning uh, 51 uh, too. Uh, oh yeah, my goodness. A few, a few you weeks look great. <laughs> and one of the things that brings me joy, uh, Pastor Danielle, is really just living in your authenticity and mm. being authentic. You know, a lot of times mm. we live all of our lives for other people, mm. other institutions. Yeah. And just sort of you kind of reach a point in your life where mm. you just understand the importance of being yourself. Yes. As I say that, I think about my second born child. I have a transgender daughter and mm. uh just yesterday um got papers to have her name formally changed and just to have family grandparents aunts uncles and mm. cousins support her and send mm. uh, uh text messages and members of the church support that as well and to watch my child you know walk in her own authenticity um, for me is a joy yeah. and uh, it really does my heart good to see, to live in my own authenticity, to see my child do the same and to see others live in and walk in their own God-given authenticity. Yes. Amen. Thank you both. Listen, Fainless Classroom, let's give it up for Lakeitha Anderson and Reverend Dr. Delman Coates. This has been a phenomenal conversation. And I, again, We'll be in touch. We want to definitely do a part two uh, as we lean into this. And so, but off camera, I'm going to be in touch with you, Dr. Coates and Lakeith, because I think there are some important things we ought to be doing, uh, like right now. And I really want to see how we might be able to connect and continue to broaden the scope of the work and what we're trying to do here and how we connect. Because everybody in here knows, especially Sneak and Cheryl knows, I'm, I love to collaborate for me, mm -hmm. it's all about mm -hmm. how do we kind of build and collaborate and consolidate resources in all the various type of capital we have access to with this human intellectual, et cetera. Because, Dr. Coach, you talked a lot about, I, I hear how you do this work. It it's very interdisciplinary, and I think it has to be that, mm -hmm. right? And so mm -hmm. um, let me stop there because we're into a whole nother classroom. Right. <laughs> and everybody be mad at me because I'm still talking. So thank you all so much for being with us on today. And listen, thank you for joining Family's Classroom on this Thursday. We look forward to next Thursday. Mark your calendar. Be back with us. We're going to have Dr. Anne-Marie Mingo with us. She has a new book out called Have You Got Good Religion? And we're excited about her joining us. She'll also be with us on Sunday. She'll be preaching, having a book signing. She'll be here on Wednesday night to further unpack that book. And also, which leads itself into why we want you to be here on next Wednesday, it is our annual Broken Wells Lecture Series. And so Dr. Mingo will be in conversation with Dr. Haynes and will also take the opportunity to honor Representative Tony Rose and her, all of her work she's done in the legis Texas legislature. But more specifically, we're going to honor her for helping get an HB 12 passed, which expands the care for mothers after giving birth from six months to 12 months as you know we're doing a lot around awareness as well as um, policy advocacy for m black maternal health and maternal health in the state of Texas. So Dr. Emma Rubingo will be with us on Wednesday night join me and you don't want to miss her she's phenomenal and she's brilliant so we want to hear from her and we'll continue the conversation with her on Family's Classroom on the following Thursday so if you didn't get your questions asked and answered on Wednesday night we'll do more of that with Dr. Mingo in Fanlu's classroom right here next Thursday 12 o'clock noon we look forward to seeing you here in the classroom and of course lastly you can support us by buying a Fanlu classroom t-shirt you can scan that QR code if you are watching on YouTube if you're listening on uh, another platform where it says audio you can go to friendshipwest.org go to justice and you will see a link to purchase Fan Loose Classroom t-shirt. That just helps us to keep, make sure we can continue to have our phenomenal team as well as amazing guests that we bring you every week um, to support the work that we do. Thank you so much for being here this week and we look forward to seeing you next week in the classroom. From the church house.